you grew up in Canada? I did in Montreal. Well, I wouldn't say grew up. I was born in Montreal and we left the States. I mean, we left Canada to move to the States when I was seven. So I grew up definitely in the, in the United States, but like I was born in Canada. Do you have good memories of Montreal? Oh, definitely. And I, you know, I'm like, I have a lot of cousins who live in Canada. So we go back a lot and um, I definitely have very good memories of there. You maintain a dual citizenship? I am only a Canadian citizen, um, which is like uh -oh. so painful um, because honestly, the process to become a citizen is so um, complicated and detailed and I just keep kept putting it off. And then when I really wanted to be able to vote in this last election, that meant I would have had to become a citizen and have my citizen papers signed by someone I didn't want. Oh. I didn't want their name on there. Yeah. So you know what? I'm just gonna wait until Biden is president, hopefully, and then and then start the process. So it's something I'm I'm going through right now. Um, but yes, eventually I'll be a dual citizen. Now, did you fall in love with acting when you were young? I mean, very young, or was that something that was a, a, a gradual, um, you know, kind of introduction? Um, it was sort of when I was very young. I, I knew that I wanted to always perform, be it dancing or gymnastics or um, the theater. I, I knew from second grade that it was something that I wanted to do. Now, obviously when you're in second grade, like it just seems like a fairy tale. You don't really know the process. You don't know the steps to take, mm -hmm. but it's something that never left me and um, something I always wanted for sure. So you were performing at a very young age and like doing little tap dance routines and... Totally, exactly. And you know, like school plays. Like my parents are immigrants, right? They didn't know where to get me in an acting class. Um, so for the longest time, it was just whatever the school had. Dance lessons were easy. That's something that like every immigrant parent know, knows, you know, like they know musical instrument, they know sports, and they know like some sort of like ballet dance but they didn't know about theater. And it wasn't until I was in, really until sixth grade, that the teachers called my parents and were like, we're begging you to put her in a class. And my mom was like, well, tell me where the classes are. And they did, so. Was there a lot of racism in public school that you? You, um, you know, it's, uh, so I grew up in Nashville mainly, like the place that I was the most was in Nashville, Tennessee. And before that it was Raleigh, North Carolina. You know, it's it's so tricky, right? I wouldn't say there was the kind of outward racism we have right now. Yeah. It was more like microaggressions, right? It, it was like very little things. It was it was overall philosophies that were sort of underneath everyone's behavior. But there was no, you know, no one called me any sort of derogatory term you know more than anything it had to do with my religion um I'm, I'm not christian and i think that was harder um but it was never again it was never like like how dare you it was more like we're really worried about you we don't want our friend to go to hell and so it was it was never um i didn't suffer in that sense in any way. I, I felt othered, but that was more internal. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I didn't, there wasn't any sort of like explicit racism. It but it was, that, it was that kind of kindness that overly, we're, we wanna save you. <laughs> yes, there was a lot of wanting to save me. There was a lot of wanting to save me. And it was always done in a friendly way. And it, you know, which is is like harder to deal with in a way because it, it, it's so sincere and it's so earnest and you're, you can't argue with that. And so it's like, well, you know, I'm really sorry. I guess in your worldview, I, I am gonna go to hell and you know, that's okay because there is a lot of um, division in our business. <laughs> there is a lot of microaggressions and a lot of racism and a lot of, as a woman of color um, who has auditioned in this business and has attempted to work in this business for a long time, there's a lot of colorism and a lot of racism. Um, 
they are working on it. Mm -hmm. They are improving. Um, but um, I think theater people are more um, adept at recognizing the truth. Mm -hmm. I think that when everything happened and, and the, you know, in 2016 and then sort of um, the, you know, the movements that have been occurring, whether it's Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ, we are sort of on the front lines. A lot of times, like the second we realize something, we're very quick to say, yes, you're right. Let me learn about this. Let me work on it. Let me become a part of the solution. So I think actors in that sense are generally, not all, but generally more um, forward thinking. And so we are, we tend to be more accepting and, and loving. Um, but that is not to say that our business is without flaws. You mentioned auditioning and, and, and uh, are you a good auditioner? <laughs> You know, yes and no. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's like there are certain auditions that are really in my wheelhouse and there are certain auditions. You know, I think um, auditioning for actors, it is goes against the very nature of acting, of theater, of performance. It's like antithetical. I think self tapes are a lot easier than going in because then I am allowed to really give my best performance because the fact of the matter is, is TV and film is not theater. We, we don't get just one take. Yeah. We, we get multiple takes and we are relaxed. You know, theater audition, I am much more at ease in because you're on a stage and there's just something that clicks when you're on a stage. But when you're auditioning for TV and film in a, in a room, it is just not, it, I don't know, it doesn't translate. I prefer self-tapes. I am not the best auditioner. I, I, I recently was, I auditioned on a Zoom audition and I didn't like it. Yeah, I haven't done those, but I have friends who have and they have not liked it. Like you, I enjoy being in front of, you know, three or four people and just do it. And then they'll say, you know, hey, can you do this a little bit different and and, and all of that. But self-taping is hard for me. We, well, my husband's an actor. So self-taping is like, is so nice because I have an actor who is really talented reading with me. I have an actor who I have like natural chemistry with. I have an actor who I went to grad school with. So we, we, we know how good we can be and we know when we're on and we know when we're off. So in that sense, like, it's just, it's like golden. Like, of course I would rather work with him than in a room with, you know, people that aren't, aren't actors. This portion of Screen Chatter is presented by VP Dental. Check out our great dental plan starting at just $16 per month. You attended the American Conservatory uh, Theater in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Was that a great experience for you? It was the greatest experience. Um, I might get emotional because the head of the program that was my mentor passed away last week. Um, oh it was the best three years that I have ever experienced. It is like this this little world, you're in this bubble of, of discovering something new about yourself every day, about being challenged, about really being pushed to go beyond what you could ever think you could do. Um, and the skills that I learned in graduate school, I use as a mom, I use as a wife, I use just as a human being on a like daily basis. Like literally some of the things I teach my daughter are verbatim the things that my mentor at ACT would talk to me about. And it's, um, so it, it went beyond an acting program, but it definitely also prepared me. Like any audition I get, I'm not worried whether or not I can do it because I know that the skills are there and the craft is there. That was uh, ingrained in you uh, during those three years. I, I think 
these schools help in confidence and understanding the core you? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, I think the thing that my mentor was like best at, Melissa Smith was best at, was that she had a, it was like a super power. She could look at you and figure out, and not just, it was like every student, it wasn't just me. We didn't have some special connection, although we did, but it, it was really every single student that went through there. She could look at you and know who you were under the mask. She could also see the mask, see the walls, see the obstacles, know your hang ups. And then she would like blow them to smithereens. I mean, it was just, you're, you end up so um, sort of uh, bared and, and vulnerable. And then she teaches you that there's power in vulnerability. And, um, and she believed in potential. She believed in everyone's potential, but more than that, she wanted you to believe in your potential. And that is like, the, the biggest gift is for you to believe in yourself. And it shows in everything that you do that, that you take all of this to heart. I imagine that every set you've been on, everything that you've done, uh, live theater, television, movies, has all been an education. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, the moment you start learning, it's, it's like the moment you start dying. I don't know. It's like, it's like, I learn something every day. I learn things from my children's teachers. I learn things, you know, so it's like, I don't know. Yeah, I, I hope I always continue learning something. Do you ever just take time and sit in a mall or a situation like that and just listen to people talking as they pass you by and and look at them and go, wow, there's a character I'd like to play? Um, no. <laughs> I've never done that. I can see my husband doing that. Um, but no, I mean, if someone like, if I'm just, I don't have, you know, it's like my life isn't structured in a way where I could just like sit in a mall. If I'm in a mall, it's like I'm returning clothes or I'm like accomplishing something or I'm looking for like picture day outfits for my kids or like, uh, I know an event is coming up that I have to be at, although that hasn't happened in a while because of the pandemic. Um, but there's like very little of me sitting in a mall and observing, but like sometimes we'll be in a restaurant and I'll notice someone and I'm like, oh, that's an inter interesting quirk or someone will say something to me and they have an interesting accent and I'll be like, oh, keep that in the like back pocket. So I, I notice things, but I no, I don't go and observe humanity. You're in this wonderful, wonderful comedy, Chad, on TBS. Was it was it a hard audition to, to get that? So I actually auditioned for this role twice. <laughs> because you know it happened twice, right? There was the first pilot that was at Fox and I auditioned for that and I tested for it. And for the, for the longest time, they didn't have anyone to test against me. Um, I was just sort of like, okay. Um, but the problem was I was just too young at the time. I didn't look like I could have a 15 year old son. So interestingly, when this audition came up, I had been in another audition for a Persian pilot. I didn't like the pilot. It was like, not good. <laughs> and it's sort of like, it was a Persian pilot written by a Persian, but it kind of, all the jokes were at the expense of our culture. Yeah. And I remember during the audition, I was like, God, this is not the Persian pilot that should get on TV. It should have been Chad, because that was a great pilot. And I was talking about it, not knowing that they were doing it again. And I'm not kidding you, the very next day, I got a call from my agent to audition for Chad again. And I was the very first person that auditioned. And it just felt like it was my role. Like from the very first time I read it. And this time I was older and I actually looked my age. Um, so it worked out. And, and, in the, and in the script, she actually mentions a few times what a young mom I am. So I think that helped a little, but um, no, it was in terms of the material, it was an easy audition. Well, there right. is a there is a huge difference in an audience laughing at someone and laughing with someone, and I think Chad does uh, does the latter beautifully because you're yeah. you're involved in a culture, but it's not making fun of the culture. You are experiencing the culture. Right. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. And the jokes are really about 
Chad's awkwardness and Chad's inability to accept himself, which are <laughs> universal themes, not just Persian themes. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, it's a universal right. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. And, and so I'm so glad. As a single mom, I want to make sure my kids have healthy teeth. Going to the dentist can be expensive. Just a simple cleaning can cost over $100. Then I found TDA. And for about a dollar a day, Total Dental Administrators covers my family on over 200 dental procedures. Whether you're an individual, a family, self-employed, or retired, your acceptance is guaranteed for one of these policies. Call or click for your free information kit and see how affordable dental health can be. Is there a role that you would love to play? Um, I would love for me, um, I love like Jane Austen novels. From this is like if we're gonna go to like wish fulfillment, yeah. um, it you know, I love something like Victorian of the Victorian era. Um, you know, with like petticoats and like corsets and the British accent. Like to me, um, I would love to be in a series like that or in a Shakespearean adaptation on film. Um, like the classics for me is where I'm drawn to much more so than sort of like um, modern uh, prose. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, anything like, you know, of that realm I, I love, but you don't, you know, they always, they generally always cast white people. So it's like, so that's why I say wish fulfillment. Like if, if I could have my wish mm -hmm. that God, that is what I want. I, I would want to be in a good period piece. Good period. piece. Yes. Did you study uh, uh, literature when you were younger? Did you, did you read a lot of uh, Victorian books and, and all? I mean, I, I love a good Victorian romance. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, in grads, again, we go back to grad school, it's a classical training. I did Shakespeare, I did Ibsen, I did Oscar Wilde, I studied Shaw, I studied, you know, um, and some in undergrad as well, I studied Shaw in undergrad. But so the classics are definitely like what I'm drawn to and it's what my training was for the most part. I did a lot of Shakespeare when I was younger and uh, it, it really helps with using your tongue it really helps with pronunciation and people find that language very awkward but i i never did no it's a muscle you, you know you have to have the the speech um and the breathing um you know and the vocal craft um and it's it requires rigor <laughs> like you have to be it is rigorous um but i love it i, I just love it what's what's the best part of your job uh, live theater, being in front of an audience and communicating non-verbally with them. So like when you're doing a comedy in front of an audience, they tell you how far you can push a joke. From the very first joke, the set, very first setup and punchline, the, and how they laugh, they are communicating how far you can go. And that feeling of of just understanding an audience. Um, and in a drama, it's just jumping on that wave and just riding the wave throughout the play. It feels like flying. There is nothing like the feeling of live theater, nothing. Yeah, and you can never repeat a performance again. It is what it is. And that audience sees a different show every night. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Do you enjoy the camaraderie of a theater troupe? Uh, you mean like just uh, like everyone involved in the play, yeah. collaborative? I mean, it's a collaborative art, so uh, like I love that. I think any actor is a collaborator, um, and yeah, it, it feels like you're in, you're a little family. Like on tech days, and you're all there for hours, and you're tired, and you're hungry. I don't know. Just it, it's like you're in it together. It's fantastic. Do people still get together for uh, uh, table reads? Yes, we do. Uh, well, 
The last table read we did post pandemic, it was via Zoom. So I have no idea what it's gonna be like coming up. Um, we start filming season two starting October 7th. I have no idea what to expect. Like, I think things are um, very different, but we, we always do a table read, even if it's via Zoom. Mm. We always do that. Yeah, and I love, I love table reads. What about your culinary uh, uh, taste? I mean, do you enjoy uh, Persian food over everything else? One of the things that the pandemic taught me is that we we don't know like how much time we have. So I, you know, the first time I saw my mom post pandemic, I was like, mom, you have to teach me all the Persian recipes because like, God, if God forbid something happens and I don't have, I don't have those. It's like, it's such a loss, especially because she's such an amazing chef. Um, and then I want to be able to pass them down to both my children. I want to thank you so much for for being a guest uh, on on the full uh, screen chatter show. You are just a dynamite actress. Well, congratulations again, and and uh, all the best to you and your family. And and you have a wonderful, wonderful 2022. Thank you. You as well. And I'll see you. Uh, on the, I I think I'll see you during the the junket for. Uh, Chad when when they announce season two. So hopefully we'll catch up on on that as well. I hope you don't get tired of me. I will not ever get tired of you. <laughs>